Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Singularity Podcast. Singularity Podcast is a regular feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and download it or listen to it in full. Today, I have the privilege of having Terry Grossman for my guest. Terry Grossman, MD, is one of America's leading authorities in anti-aging and longevity medicine. He has co-authored two books with famed inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil, the first one called Transcend, Nine Steps to Living Well Forever, and the previous one was called Fantastic Voyage. A 1968 graduate from Brandeis University, Dr. Grossman received his MD from the University of Florida in 1979. Following his postgraduate training in St. Joseph's Hospital in Denver, he spent 15 years as a community family doctor in the Colorado Mountains before opening Grossman Wellness Center in Denver in 1994. His clinic emphasizes advanced nutritional therapies and preventive anti-aging medicine. Grossman has developed numerous cutting-edge protocols for measuring and modifying biological age and promoting longevity. So, without further ado, let me start this interview by welcoming Dr. Terry Grossman to Singularity Podcast. Hi, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Very well, Terry, it's entirely our pleasure. Let me jump straight into the questions by asking you to share a little bit with our viewers and listeners about your background and more specifically, how you got to be interested in medicine in general and in anti-aging and longevity in specific. Uh, Well, I've been a doctor for uh, a little over 30 years. And during that period of time, I spent the first 15 years that I was a doctor Uh, practicing medicine in a conventional sense, the same way that I had been taught in medical school. Uh, I was a small town doctor in the uh, Colorado mountains, and I delivered babies at the local 19 bed hospital. Uh, I took care of the children from the local uh, YMCA camp when they got fish hooks or uh, fell off of horses. I also was called in to uh, take care of people who got in bar fights at two o'clock in the morning. So uh, it was a very interesting and varied practice, and I enjoyed it a lot from 1980 to 1995. But uh, around 1993, 1994, I was fortunate enough to have attended the first meeting of a new society called the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, A4M. And uh, anti-aging medicine was born in about 1994, and that was at the age I was uh, 48, And I personally had just begun to experience this process we refer to as aging. And I had had started to develop a few little symptoms that were robbing me of the type of youthful vitality I'd been used to having prior to that. So I was fascinated when I saw this uh, advertisement in a medical journal for anti-aging medicine. I went to the meeting and my life and practice was changed forever because I decided that I would begin to look at aging, the process of aging, as a disease and see what I could do in my medical practice to help both myself and my patients to slow down, to stop, uh, to measure, to assess this uh, process of aging. Uh, So beginning in 1995, I moved from the small town in the Colorado mountains and opened the Grossman Wellness Center in Denver and uh, have been doing this type of preventive anti-aging medicine ever since. That's a, that's a fascinating story. Uh, maybe we can dig in a little bit deeper into the sort of philosophical or ethical dimensions because that seems to be a huge change of your mindset from uh, treating um, people who fell off from horses or after bar fights, etc., going into the cutting-edge field of, of uh, anti-aging and longevity medicine and especially your point of view of perceiving uh, death as a disease rather than as a normal part of life. Uh, would you mind sharing how that whole worldview, that, that's a fundamental worldview, how did it change for you? Uh, it just seemed to me that I know that we have the ability to live, the human being can live to 124 years. Today, that is our maximum lifespan. No one can live beyond 124 years due to the telomeres on the end of our chromosomes. The longest period of time that any human being has been documented to live was uh, the woman from France, Ms. Calment, 
yeah. who lived to be 122 and a half. However, number one, less than one person in a billion lives to be, the statistics are one person in 1,000 lives to be 100, one person in a million lives to be 110, and one person in a billion lives to be 120, and none of us live past 124. And even so, most of us don't even experience optimal health for much more than 30 or 40 years. Yeah. And it's because we have been essentially uh, programmed by circumstances, by both our genetics and the epigenetic circumstances of our lifestyles for tens of thousands of years to survive in an environment where it really didn't make much sense for us to live for more than 30 years. The 30 years is important because we were given 15 years to grow up, to learn how to survive in the world, then to reproduce, and then to have 15 more years to take care of the next generation, uh, to teach them how to survive in the world. And then at that point, we became simply an extra mouth to feed, and it makes sense for us to, to experience this, quote, aging process, uh, which is designed to rob us of our health and to get rid of us. Uh, if by some chance we were lucky enough to live past 30, uh, then we made it to 50, then women go through menopause, men go through andropause, and our hormone levels begin to drop suddenly. Uh, when that happens, even more of our health is robbed. And so many people uh, are living longer periods of time, but they're not living in optimal health. So I found it a uh, very fascinating to see what we could do to modify this process with what the best of med modern medicine has to offer. So speaking of the best that modern medicine has to offer, uh, would you consider your research of anti-aging and longevity uh, to be part of mainstream medicine or sort of at the fringe even, cutting edge or even the fringe of medicine? Because, I mean... I have a, a number of friends who are medical doctors, and most of them do not perceive death as a disease. I mean, most, most of them would consider uh, death beyond their remedy. And, and, and uh, quite natural at, at, at the end of life. So ideologically, even if you will, life extension beyond, say, 120 years uh, would that be a normal possibility, and would that be one considered as part of mainstream advanced uh, medic medical science today? Well, I don't regard death as a disease. I regard aging as a disease, uh -huh. and I regard death as a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And it's one that hopefully we will be able to forestall, and people will be able to live to their 80s, their 90s, beyond 100, and then eventually beyond 120. I think we will see people later this century being able to live past 150 and 200 years of age, but they will also be living in vigorous good health. Uh, so most conventional physicians and most people today are accustomed to thinking about aging in the old-fashioned way, exactly. uh, the image of an 80-year-old like Whistler's mother, which is someone who is in a wheelchair, uh, who needs someone to help take care of uh, them, uh, whose mental and physical faculties are not optimal. But that's not what I look at. What I look at is uh, I have many patients uh, who are in their 80s and in their 90s. They're still at work. They're working full-time. Uh, they enjoy vigorous, good health. They're still exercising. Their minds are sharp. So this is what we're looking for. Yet it takes a while for conventional physicians uh, to accept this as part of mainstream medicine because I was trained as a conventional doctor, and what I learned in medical school was that aging is a natural process. It's normal, and it's really not something that, as physicians, we should be looking to treat as a disease. We should treat diseases. In other words, we are, uh, as medical doctors, more reactive than proactive. We wait for disease to happen far too often. We wait for patients to develop high blood pressure. We wait for patients to develop diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's disease. But we do have the ability, I think, to detect early stages of these processes to a far better extent than we have been doing so far. 
And if we can make these earlier detections, I think we can be much more aggressive and nip these diseases in the bud so that they don't have their full expression. So let me go back to your original motivation uh, going to that meeting. Um, you were at 48 at the time, and you said you yourself started to experience uh, the first uh, symptoms of, of aging. Um, and would that be your main motivation today, or what would it be? Would it be uh, trying to extend your own life and the lives of people that are close to you emotionally, etc., or is it a general humanitarian uh, motivation that you have uh, pushing to, to move forward on your research? Well, I am, um, I am a doctor, and this is my calling. This is my life. I love being a doctor. I love people. And I regard it as my life work, my mission to help my patients to live as healthy and as long as possible and in the best quality of life as possible. So I feel that by practicing anti-aging medicine, by pre practicing preventive medicine, I am helping my patients to the best degree possible. And of course, since I'm helping my patients, I'm interested in helping my friends and helping my family and helping myself as well. And in that case, there seems to be the, the main focus uh, from reactive medicine to a proactive medicine, from one which uh, creates responses to certain diseases to one that anticipates in advance and sort of eliminates the advancement of those uh, diseases, or at least their progression. Uh, so what would be, in your opinion, the best way to push forward? Or what would be, say, the top nine tips that you have from your book, maybe, to um, increase longevity? Well, I could give a couple examples. The two main pillars that uh, Ray Kurzweil and I talk about in uh, our last book, Transcend, yeah. is prevention of disease and early detection of disease. Prevention of disease is things that people can do by themselves, by the lifestyle choices they make, by eating properly, exercising well, controlling their stress, controlling their weight, taking supplementation, etc. And then early detection would be things that are typically done with the assistance of medical professionals to have appropriate blood tests, ultrasound scans and things like that. To give you an example of how we could do things, I think, far better than we're doing them today, the two greatest killers in the United States and in most of the developed world are heart disease and cancer. Yeah. Between these two diseases, they are responsible for almost 53% of all deaths. We have the ability to detect cancer and heart disease at early stages today far better than we're doing, and we can do that inexpensively. But because conventional medicine is still mired down in the old paradigm of waiting for symptoms to occur, we are not, we are not catching these diseases early. So with respect to heart disease, there are two tests that I love to see people get. Uh, yet most doctors do not recommend them. And when I give lectures in the public, and I ask for a show of hands how many people have had these tests done, typically one in 10 to one in 20 of the people will raise their hands that they've done these tests. The two tests you could do for heart disease are number one, what's called a coronary artery calcium score. It's a simple CAT scan test that uh, uh, looks at the coronary arteries and tells you if they have any obstruction in the arteries. If you find that that you do, you can take a very aggressive approach so that you don't go on to become a statistic by having a heart attack, which could either leave you with permanent damage or, God forbid, kill you. The second test you could do is called advanced lipid testing. This is where you look not only at the good cholesterol like HDL, the bad cholesterol, the LDL, but you dig deeper. You look at the good HDL, the bad HDL. And these two tests together can be done for about $350. So for a relatively small amount of money, people can practice preventive medicine to detect the number one cause of death in the United States to a far greater degree than we're doing today. If you compare that $300 per person to what it costs for one bypass surgery, to treat which is them. close to 
hundred thousand dollars. If we could prevent one angioplasty for fifty thousand dollars, just think of the money we could save. I mean, we're having such a problem paying for uh, health care, yeah. which is really sickness care in the United States. If we would be taking a more proactive approach, I think we could be doing a much better job. The same thing applies with the number two cause of death, cancer. We do a great job of screening for only four cancers, colon cancer with colonoscopies, breast cancer with mammograms, cervical cancer with pap smears, and prostate cancers with digital rectal exams and PSA tests. But that's only four cancers. Yet, by doing the screening for these four cancers, we're doing a great job, and death rates from those cancers are way down. Problem is, there's 250 kinds of cancers. We're only screening for four. We could do a much better job with ultrasound, with thermography, of screening for these other cancers, and try to detect them before they have spread, when they're still in a localized state. Because if you can find cancer when it's stage one before it's spread, it's curable 90% of the time. Whereas if you only detect cancer when it's spread or metastasized, it's curable less than 10% of the time. So I really feel that we have the tools today, but we're simply not using them to the degree that we could. And what, what age do you recommend? I'm, for example, 34 years old. So should I be going and doing those tests as you recommend, or am I too young? Or what, what age should people go and test themselves at? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, I feel that for the, I mean, you could do them at any age, but I feel where it makes the most sense for doing the, uh, the heart screening, where you get the advanced lipid testing and the coronary artery calcium test, yeah. that men should do this test at 45 years of age and women should do this test at 50 years of age. That's when we start because that's the point at which we really start to find pathology in a significant percentage of people. If you come from a family where there is a strong history of heart disease and strokes, particularly at a young age, then you might push this up where men would do the screening at, say, 40 years of age and women do it 45. If you come from a family where some of the men have heart attacks in their 20s or 30s, then I think it makes sense to do this screening even in your 20s or 30s. So these are the general rules of thumb that I do. And I would also do the cancer screening beginning around 45 or 50 as well. I see. So speaking of your family history, uh, what about genetic testing? Should we be also adding a DNA test to see what our genetic predispositions to develop specific diseases are? I haven't been as enthusiastic more recently with uh, genomics testing as I was over the past few years, but there are some excellent genomics tests that can give us a lot of information. For instance, uh, two genes that I think it's very important to know about are the Alzheimer's gene, known as the APOE gene, mm -hmm. and the BRCA gene, BRCA, the breast cancer gene. Because if we find out that we're genetically predisposed to Alzheimer's disease, whether we have a family history or not, we can begin taking steps early in life uh, to, to take the best care of our brains possible, to take care of our memories so that we don't have the minimum chance of developing Alzheimer's later on. And similarly, if a woman does the, the BRCA gene testing, finds out she has one of the genes that dramatically increases her chances of having breast cancer, uh, if a woman is positive for the BRCA1 gene, it's not a matter of if she's going to get breast cancer, it's a matter of when she's going to get breast cancer. So she really needs to take steps to protect her health, to have her daughters tested so that it doesn't go on to be the case. So I believe that particularly in younger people, genomics testing does make a lot of sense uh, and it has a lot of value. And the good news is the price of genomics testing is coming down. Right now we have what's called SNP testing, where they check these single nucleotide polymorphisms. What is even better than this is whole genome sequences, where we can actually look at the entire uh, 25,000 genes in the human body. This testing cost $300,000 as recently as 2007, yet it has fallen one year later in 08 to uh, $99,000 to $20,000 in 09 to $5,000 today. And I think within two or three years will be perhaps $100 to $500, a price that we can all have our genome tested and we'll have all this information available to us uh, unfortunately, we'll have to wait a few years for the scientists 
to make sense of all this data, but we will have the raw data available to us very inexpensively in the near future. And I think that's going to help us dramatically to make personalized lifestyle choices. So I presume for people under 40, the, the DNA test would be the better starting point then eventually when it becomes, say, under $1,000 per test or something. Absolutely. Affordable. Absolutely. I think that the, the gene testing for people under 40 make a lot of sense to do because then you know what diseases you're predisposed to so you know in what direction you want to look and in what direction you want to be most careful with your lifestyle choices. Well, let's take, for example, me. I know that you know I haven't done any testing yet, but I know that from the history of my family, um, I may be likely uh, or at a higher risk than normal to develop both uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, diabetes because both my father, my grandfather, and my grandmother had all of those. What do I do? I'm 34 years old. I'm very active. I'm cyclist. I am uh, not overweight. Um, and yet, what else can I do than the traditional things with proper nutrition and proper active, healthy lifestyle? What well, can for, I add to that? Yeah, well, for avoidance of diabetes in particular, I think the best thing you can do are the things you're doing. Keeping your weight down, getting plenty of exercise, and avoiding high glycemic index foods. The sugary foods, the high starchy foods, things like that. Because these put a strain on your pancreas the cells that make the insulin, which eventually will wear out and lead to diabetes. So since you have a family history of those, that is the type of diet that you want to follow. Uh, in terms so no of, pasta, I guess. Huh? No pasta. Uh, I would be pretty cautious with pasta. Pasta would be something that you would do as a treat maybe once every month or two. Uh, but it wouldn't be something that you want to have once a week or twice a week because it puts a huge strain on the insulin-secreting cells. Uh, things like white potatoes also things like uh, white bread and bagels, these put a big strain on the insulin-secreting cells. So I would avoid these and replace them with the whole grains, uh, uh, more vegetables, uh, some fruits, and protein sources. And those would be the best dietary sources for somebody like yourself. In terms of avoidance of heart disease, which also runs in your family, I think even at your age of 34, maybe you don't need to do the advanced lipid testing, but the basic lipid testing makes sense. Check your cholesterol, check your triglycerides, check your HDL, check your LDL, and make sure they're in the perfect range. And if they're not, then you need to be more aggressive with your diet. And if being more aggressive with your diet doesn't bring it down, you could either consider taking a statin drug or consider taking some supplements like red yeast rice, niacin, and plant sterols, which are very nice for lowering cholesterol uh, without having uh, the side effects of the statin drug. So there's many things you can do, even at your age, to reduce your chances of diabetes and heart disease to an absolute minimum. And what about on the uh, active lifestyle? I mean, let's take you, for example. You seem to be incredibly fit and, and very uh, energetic and, and youthful. And I'm very impressed. I mean, if, if I want to follow an example, I, I definitely want to find out your secrets. What do you do for a healthy, active lifestyle? Well, I try to, I try to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. So yeah. I try to follow the type of diet we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. I try to get good exercise. Uh, I try to control my stress. I try to be socially connected. So I have many friends. I'm close to my family. Uh, I try to be connected on many levels, have many interests, use my brain, I think all aspects of life are important, both the uh, intellectual, the physical, as well as the spiritual, because we have found that being isolated has health risks equal to smoking a, path, a pack of cigarettes a day. Uh, so it is very important that we develop strong friendships, that we have love in our life. Uh, these things are all important. And I, 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 I often look at the fact that I am now 63 years of age, and I compare my health now to my health when I was 33 years of age. And 30 years later, I am stronger than I was. I am in many ways healthier than I was. I believe in a lot of ways I am wiser than I was. Uh, my memory is as good as it was. I am happier than I was. And I like to tell people that if I knew it was going to be this much fun to get older, 
that I would have been older first. <laughs> That's so fantastic. Think, and many of my friends tell me the same thing. They say that they're calmer, uh, that they're happier. So I think if as long as you maintain your health, getting older does not is not a tragedy because there's a big difference between getting older and aging. All of us must get older. Every every second, every day, we're getting older. But by definition, aging is a harmful process. So what my goal for myself is, and what my goal for you and my patients is, is to grow older without aging. So, would you mind me asking, what is your biological age then? Yeah, my biological age, the last I checked, which was three years ago, was 42. So I was 61. Years. I was 61. My biological age was 42. So I was 19 years younger than my chronological age. And I have many patients that are even younger than I am from their biological age. I have some patients that are 25 and 26 years younger than their chronological age. So this is entirely doable. Wow, that's, that's very impressive. But how realistic it is to expect the same kind of difference in another 20 years, for example. Do you believe hope, that when I you're hope. 83... You could be biologically 50 or, fi or 60 or... Yeah, uh, like uh, one of my patients, I was just looking at his chart uh, yesterday. When he first came to see me, he was nine years younger than his biological age. That's when he was 45. He came back and we tested him again five years later. And then he was 17 years younger than his, biological, than his chronological age. And then when we tested him this year, when he was uh, 54... He was younger again, 19 years younger than his uh, chronological age. So, in effect, he is getting younger and younger all the time. So, it is possible to grow older, but yet biologically to grow younger. So, and that's our goal. I think it's entirely doable. I think it becomes more difficult as we get older, but it's not impossible. You just have to spend more energy at it. And how important is supplementation in that process? I mean, could I just rely on proper nutrition, get reading, getting rid of the high glycemic foods and lots of physical activities and all the mental things that you mentioned like relaxation and being socially active and so on? Or do I need to have a very strict and regimented uh, supplementing uh, schedule? I think the lifestyle choices are the most important. I think the diet, exercise, stress management, social connectedness, etc., they are the mainstays, but I think supplementation can be extremely helpful as well. Uh, most of us, our diet, no matter what it is, we're not growing our own food. Uh, it's not as nutritionally uh, beneficial as we would like. So I think a lot of us should take a multiple vitamin mineral. 90% of my patients uh, seem to have very low levels of vitamin D. We don't spend enough time in the sunshine, so I think we should take supplemental vitamin D. Uh, we know now that inflammation is an enormous source of big diseases, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, arthritis. These are all inflammatory diseases. We can reduce inflammation significantly by taking extra fish oil. We know about uh, resveratrol, uh, David Sinclair's elegant studies uh, from, uh, from uh, Harvard have showed us that uh, taking supplemental resveratrol mimics the effect of calorie restriction, uh, which is one of the most powerful methods of reversing aging and increasing a life expectancy. So I think there's many things we can do with supplementation. Let me ask you this. In your book, uh, Transcend, you have those uh, nine key components, um, things such as talk with your doctor, relaxation, assessment, nutrition, supplements, calorie reduction, exercise, new technology, new technologies and detoxification. I think that the ones that we haven't touched yet on were calorie reduction and detoxification. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about those two specific elements? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with uh, calorie reduction and calorie restriction, this has been known as the only method that has so far been proven to increase life expectancy across all animal species that we have tested. And we know that in the Japanese uh, prefecture of uh, Okinawa, Japan has among the greatest longevity in the world. Yeah. Okinawa has the greatest longevity within Japan. And in Okinawa, it is common for them when they sit down to eat a meal to say a type of grace that goes hara hachibu. 
stomach ate parts full. So they try to restrict their calories when they sit down to eat. And this is translated into significant uh, longevity for the people in Japan and in Okinawa. So what I recommend that people do, I, I call it calorie restriction made simple. There's two things people can do. Like for lunch today, I had what's called an Israeli salad. It's a combination of cucumbers and tomatoes and onions, uh, things along those lines. And it's a wonderful, refreshing salad. And it's uh, got a little vinegar and oil, very low calorie. So what I try to do most days a week for my main meal, have it be a salad. So by having a salad one meal a day, you cut your calories considerably. My second little rule for calorie restriction made simple is try to fast for 12 hours a night. So... I eat breakfast usually around 7 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So starting at 7 o'clock at night, I don't eat anymore. So every day for 12 hours, I don't have any calories. This, I think a lot of us eat uh, empty calories in the evening snacking. Yeah. So by doing these two simple rules, you can cut your calories down quite a bit. A third rule, I was just at the Personalized Life Extension, Life Extension Conference in San Francisco this past weekend. And one of the other speakers talked about fasting one day a week. And the health benefits that come from that, they have shown that if you go for 24 hours a week, so you have supper one night and then you don't eat until supper the next night, by doing that one day a week, you have a lot of the same effects of calorie restriction done in animals. In other words, you turn the youthful genes on. So I'm thinking I may begin to do the one day a week, 24-hour uh, fasting uh, to see if that will change my genes for, for longevity also. So that's uh, some simple rules that people can consider trying for calorie reduction. In terms of detoxification... Let me just stop you just yes. for a second. In terms of the calorie reduction, people mention numbers anywhere from 15 or 20% to about 35 to 40%. What would be the general ref recommendation that you would believe in or that you would subscribe to? <clears throat> I believe 20% is a good calorie reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you normally would eat... 2,000 calories a day, if you would eat 1,600 calories a day, I think you can get a lot of health benefits by 20% calorie reduction. The animal experiments are 35% reduction. Yeah. That may be better for humans, but I know many people that do the 35% calorie reduction, they're, they're often hungry, they're very gaunt, uh, they, they, they don't have as much energy as, uh, as they'd like. I have treated many of them as patients. They don't strike me as healthy as they could be. So I think 35% calorie reduction is a little bit too much for humans. Uh, maybe it's possible, but uh, I think 20% calorie reduction plus maybe taking resveratrol to get some of those benefits may be a more uh, moderate path for, for most people to consider. Great. All right. So let's, let's move to your thoughts on detoxification then. Yeah. Detoxification, uh, the, the problem we have is we live in a very polluted world. It's not possible to, to eat organic all the time. Uh, so I think it behooves us to do what we can to try to come up with a, a program of detoxification. So number one, we should eat organic as much as possible. That way we get less toxins coming into our body. Uh, and then we also want to do something to get the toxins out of our body. So I, I like exercise. When you exercise, you sweat. Uh, sweating is a wonderful way to detoxify your body. Uh, also going into saunas, uh, the, particularly the far infrared saunas, they cause you to sweat and get rid of, uh, of toxins as well. What's called dry brushing of your skin is a very effective way of removing toxins. So there's many different strategies that people can do uh, for detoxification as well. Probably the most important one of all is drinking adequate amounts of water because water is probably our biggest detoxifier. So making sure you're adequately hydrated will help your body flush the toxins as well. You, you just mentioned that uh, you like sweating and, and exercising. What kind of exercises do you do personally? Do you stress uh, anaerobic or aerobic or do you have a strict uh, allocation of those? I try to do three types of exercise. I try to do aerobic exercise. And instead of doing aerobic exercise like I used to or even like I wrote about in my books, where you get your heart rate into the target heart range, 220 minus your age, and then 75% of that, keep it for 30 or 45 minutes. I don't do that anymore. I've begun to do the interval training based on uh, some uh, suggestions by Al Sears, my colleague in Florida. He suggests progressive interval training, 
where you uh, start at a certain rate, uh, then you rest, then you go a little bit harder, and then you rest, and you go a little bit harder, and you rest, until finally at the end of your exercise, you're going as hard as you can go. So interval training. So I've started to do interval training for my aerobics, and then I also do strength training. I believe that working out with weights or doing calisthenics, uh, push-ups and sit-ups and things like that is very important, uh, particularly as you get older, because Lonely. it raises the hormone levels. Uh, they've done studies, and they show that a man can raise testosterone levels, th- make 33 years younger the testosterone levels by doing strength training just with 12 weeks of resistance exercise. So as we get older, it becomes even more important to do the strength training exercises. And then finally, we must do the stretching because after you exercise, your ligaments and tendons tend to get tight. And if you don't stretch after you exercise, that increased tightness will put more pressure over the joints, uh, increasing your risk of joint problems and arthritis, and then you can't exercise at all. So you'd rather stretch after uh, the both the aerobic and anaerobic part of your workout rather than before? Yeah, I think you want to warm up your muscles before you exercise so you don't injure them. Uh, you, don't want to injure, you don't want to exercise cold muscles and tendons, so do a little warm-up first. Mm-hmm. But after you get done, it's most important to stretch. Mm-hmm. And in terms of yoga, do you recommend, I mean, in terms of stretching, do you recommend something like yoga or something like uh, Pilates or just general stretching exercises? Any of those are fine. I love yoga. I love Pilates. I love just general stretching. Uh, whatever people enjoy doing, all of those are wonderful exercises. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Okay, Terry, let me move a little bit our discussion into the sort of more general, more philosophical dimensions of your work. First of all, let me ask you, uh, do you have any religious beliefs, past or present? I mean, do you subscribe to any of the major religions of the world? Uh, I'm not formally religious. I was raised Jewish, and I still have uh, a connection with my faith. Uh, but I'm not formally religious per se. But I believe that the universe is imbued with, with some force, some greater power that, that I don't understand exactly, but I don't think things are all mechanistic. Uh, I think there, is, there are forces that we can tap into. I believe in the law of attraction, the law of intention. I believe that when I manifest, I believe we all create our own life. And if I manifest what I want, I find that I often get it. And if I focus on negative things, I find I often get that as well. So I try to be positive in my life. And as a result, uh, my life has become increasingly happy all the time. So would it be fair to characterize you as an agnostic then? It, it's, you know, perhaps I don't have a formal belief in, in a, a specific deity per se, but I believe there is some type of, of force, some type of energy, some type of higher being that we don't understand. Okay, so let's, let's look at it from the outside in. How do you think would your work be perceived by the major religions of the world? Let's say you're successful and in the long run you and Ray Kurzweil and others, me, maybe all of us are able to live to 120, 150, 200 years, who knows? What do you think would that would be the impact of that on the major religions and what would be their response? Well, I think that the real payoff with formal religions is people don't like the idea that at the end of life there is nothing. And what religions do to a large extent is they offer a promise that there is no end and that we will continue to live in heaven or someplace like that, uh, as we begin to live longer and longer periods of time, and perhaps we find out that there are subtle energies that we don't understand, I think that our views on religion will change in the years ahead. But I don't think that religions have any problem with a, a doctor like myself helping people to live to be 100 or 150 years of age, um, because uh, I think the, the religious leaders will also be able to live to be 100 and 150 years of age, which I think they would enjoy as well. Because, uh, you know, we can look even into the Bible. I will often take very religious people and say, I'm not sure that I, I want to live forever. All I want to do is, is be like Methuselah, who lived like 970 years in the Bible. So that's my goal. 
Yeah, but, but then, I mean, my concern is that some of those, maybe not the mainstream religions, but some fundamentalist parts of them would be opposed to us with the, some of the sort of traditional arguments. I mean, saying things such as, for example, if God wanted us to live 200 years, he would have created us to, do, to live up to 200 years, right? And by doing the work that you're doing, you're sort of meddling in higher forces, and I mean that was, that argument was given when antibiotics were introduced, when uh, vaccines were introduced. I mean, do you not have any concern about sort of a backlash? Uh, no, have I you personally don't have any concern. of that. There are very few people today that are opposed to antibiotics. There are very few people yeah, that are opposed right. to heart bypass surgery. When these, when these new innovations come along, yes, there are very conservative people that oppose them, but these, I think, just turn out to be uh, boulders in the stream that get washed downstream very quickly. Uh, I would say, no, this is not natural, but I think once uh, they see all the advantages that can come to pass when people live so much longer, so much healthier, uh, that they will regard this as a blessing and a benefit, and they will want it as well. So I don't think it's going to be a long-term opposition. That's so. So you're you're very optimistic about the way things will develop, in a sense. I am. I am. I think. I think technology has the ability to help us. Obviously, there are downsides to technology. Existential threats. We need to control the power of uh, biotechnology and nanotechnology. But it has a, such an enormous potential to help us as long as we can control it. Uh, I think it has enormous potential to help hum- humanity. Well, along the lines of your optimism, do you see some benchmarks or some uh, timeline of benchmarks that would represent our steps towards accomplishing a much longer uh, and healthier life, uh, lives than, than currently? Well, we see that uh, lifespans are increasing now by about three to five months per year. It's been fairly linear. Every year we add about three months, four months, five months to life expectancy. And that is increasing. Once we reach the point that we're adding 12 months every year, then it's like, here's where we are today, and here's the end of our life. So we add three months uh, to our life, but in a year, so it gets a little shorter. It gets a little shorter, but we live longer. But if we add... 12 months every year that the horizon keeps moving. It just keeps moving indefinitely. So at that point, it becomes meaningless to talk about life expectancy because I think we can live as long as we wish to. And I think that really will be a possibility uh, during the rest of this century. Sometime this century, we will see that as an option. And people, in some sense, may even have the option of immortality, particularly when we have the ability to download our memories and our consciousness to digital means and things like that, then essentially you can create a backup copy of yourself. Yeah, I think that moment, uh, Aubrey de Grey refers to that moment as longevity, escape velocity. Uh, but let me, let me grasp your last thought here about uploads um, and moving beyond our biology, if you will. Um, how do you see that move from biology towards technology? Maybe well, through uploading, maybe through robotics, maybe through some sort of a cyborgization of the human body by connecting it with, say, first brain implants and all kinds of other um, robotic uh, technology. Well, right now, we are humans and our machines are outside of us. So we are here and there are our computers. But more and more, the computers will become implanted within us. So we will have uh, prosthetic devices that help us to hear better, to see better. Uh, there's no reason that we couldn't. I mean, we now have the, uh, the small uh, smartphones that connect to the Internet. Uh, they're becoming smaller and smaller. Within a few years, they could be implanted and be part of us so that literally we could be interconnected to every other human being on the planet and have access without anything external to all the information in the world that there is uh, At that point, we will go from uh, being humans today to what I refer to as transhumans. We will be more than we have been in the past. And then I think it will be a a fairly short transition to go from human to transhuman 
to post humans to where we literally are able to live energetically. We can just dispense with our bodies entirely and live on an energetic level to live virtually. Uh, and at that point, we are on the other side of the singularity, and it becomes difficult to conceive of what life will be like because it'll be so vastly different than it is today. But I think it'll be very exciting, and I, I hope to be there to see it. <laughs> That's fascinating. So, so you, you are a complete believer in the singularity in that case. Yeah, I believe the singularity uh, will occur uh, before 2050, and I think that life on the other side of the singularity will be so vastly different than what we know today that it'll be uh, just so exciting. What do you think are our chances of surviving a singularity? Well, if we reach the singularity, I think our chances are very, very good of surviving it. I don't think the singularity will destroy us. I think there are certain threats that will always exist, uh, you know, in terms of bioterrorism, in terms of cyber terrorism, things like that, that could slow us down, but I don't think it's going to stop us or destroy us. What about the option that maybe, uh, for example, one of the people I was interviewing a few weeks ago was Professor Kevin Warwick from Reading University in England. And one of the concerns that he has is that uh, artificial intelligence research on its own is, is accelerating But the research of bringing together the artificial intelligence and the biological is not keeping, pa uh, keeping a pace with it. So in other words, that's falling behind. And there may be a moment when artificial intelligence is so advanced and the sort of cyborgization, which is the bridge between the biological and the technological, is not advanced to the point yet which could connect the two realms. And in that case we may simply miss the train or, or be unable to bridge the gap between us and them. And if that were to happen, of course, then we may turn into subservient species or basically a uh, million or a trillion times less intelligent than, than them. And we would have missed our opportunity to join them or to, to move on the other end of the singularity. And therefore, we could even go extinct. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't see it. I, I think that's more of a science fiction scenario. I see it more not us versus them as they are going to become part of us. Uh, I think that as artificial intelligence increases, we will integrate it within our, our brains and within our consciousness. And it's not going to be us and them. I think it's going to be an amalgamation uh, where we are part of them. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So you're You're very optimistic. Uh, I, I really enjoy uh, that point of view because so far most of my interviewees have given less than 1% and up to 25% chances of survival. For example, I was surprised, but Michael Anissimo from the Singularity Institute gave us about 25% rate of survival. Another transhumanist here from Toronto, George Dvorsky, rated us for under 1%. So would you say you're way over 50%? I mean, Professor Kevin Warwick gave us 75% or something like that, but not as humans, as something else, as the next step of evolution. Well, it's hard, it's hard to figure what we will be like on the other side of the singularity, but I think that we as humans will survive. So I feel that we will survive 100%. We are not going to be destroyed, but there may be some changes that we, we cannot expect. Uh, it may not be a smooth transition as we go to the singularity, but I don't think that we will be destroyed. That's fantastic. Terry, would you mind sharing uh, with our viewers some more information about how they can find out more information about you personally and the work you do, maybe some of the event, uh, attend some of the events that you go and speak to? Okay, well, uh, the easiest way to learn about uh, my work is through my books. My last two books were Fantastic Voyage uh, and Transcend, and those are both available uh, on Amazon. And I have a clinic in the Denver area where I practice longevity medicine. I do preventive medicine, executive health evaluations, and uh, people can find out more on my website, uh, grossmanwellness.com. Uh, so those are good, uh, two good resources, uh, and I would hope to see, see many people. I hope so, too. Um, 
And if, the, if there's one major message that you would like to give to our viewers today, what would you like it to be? The second book that Ray Kurzweil and I wrote together, Fantastic Voyage, had a subtitle. The subtitle of that book was, was Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever. And the message was, we can't live forever today, but the technologies that will enable us to live for far longer uh, periods of time will be coming soon. So take the best care of yourself you can today so that you can take advantage of what's coming in the future. Live long enough to live forever. Wow. I think uh, that's hard to match. <laughs> well, Terry, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, I wish you good luck with your work and your research. Uh, I just purchased uh, your book, Transcend, and I will certainly be reading it uh, this weekend. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.